So David, David Alzafon, sir, welcome. And thank you for joining us. Thank you for patiently waiting for so long. Great to be here. I know I, the time went by like nothing because it was all very fascinating. Yeah, Our, well, you know, I, I, you know I, I, I went to last week's session and um, Mark Sokol, and again, the, 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 all of the guys were asking about, they were asking about the ARV and then they were asking about your work. And so to have both of you here this week is really, for me, is really exciting, you know, because I, I mean, I know it absolutely dovetails into what they're doing, but then the other thing that interested me was uh, you, when we were talking about the, the Alzafon device last week, I, everyone is familiar with it to some degree or other. And uh, like, like Ron Keita, for instance, had, had talked about, uh, you know, even in the 1980s, being familiar with it. So, wow. Um, yeah. it, back in the, well, one problem with my father's efforts to publicize his technology and obtain backing, by the way, was that he had been inside the uh, ivory tower first and then inside of aerospace, and he had no public uh, image. So, um, People didn't know who he was, and they didn't know how to evaluate what he was proposing. But uh, I can see that that is changing, and I'm very, very happy about that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I will plug my book. <laughs> Not now. <laughs> well, you yeah, actually, Mark plugged your Mark, and, and yeah, Mark plugged your book. But go ahead. I would say, but you know, plug plug oh. the book again. You know. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think that was gravity control with present technologies, right? Yeah, right. Um, this is gravity control with present technology. Public ugh, Amazon. And I'll, I'll, I'll put a link up to that as well. And um, this book contains everything I could find in my personal notes and papers and recorded dialogues that ne has never appeared in print before. If you go after the things that my dad wrote, you would find some MUFON articles uh, for the MUFON Journal. You would find an interview in Charles Yost's um, Electrogravitic uh, Electric Spacecraft Journal, and that's out of print. So it was very hard to gather information about what he had done. And so I wanted to put it all together so people could easily find it. And that's the purpose of that book. When I did that, um, I discovered there was a lot about UFOs, and I'll explain that connection in a moment. But uh, as a result of that, I wrote a second book, uh, the top 10 UFO riddles there. Top 10 UFO riddles. Okay, yeah, and I will definitely put links up when we put the videos up as well to those. And the, the last part of the book includes uh, some of my own sightings, one of which Mark might might be interested in, which was um, uh, this craft right here, the TR-3B, though at the time I had no idea it was the TR-3B. I was driving on I-5 March 12, uh, 2000, the year 2000. The reason the date sticks in my mind is I had just bought a new car and I was driving to Northern California. And this is the thing that I saw. And much to my amazement, I saw the same craft on YouTube 10 years later. So, and then it had a name then I, but when I told people I knew about it, they said, oh, you didn't see uh, a real, you must've seen an airplane. But well, could could you had, hold that page up again? Yeah, it had uh, no uh, wings and it was a elongated triangle. And it kind of flew, it flew very slowly. Um, and it kind of uh, bobbed like a ship on the ocean. This is a picture of it. And mm. it flew right in front of me, almost perfectly to view the whole thing. And um, it had this, I, I, I would say artistically, this is a very beautiful design. I mean, it was so impressive. But on the other hand, there was no cabin. There were no wings. And uh, the propulsion system that it had would not account fully for its flight characteristics. Because, sure, sure. yeah, flying so slowly with uh, jet flames coming out of the back of it did not make sense. And uh, anyway, I threw that into the book along with a bunch of other sightings. And um, the discussion of UFOs is relevant because, well, historically, the development of my father's 
technology, which came after his theory, and that's a very important thing, uh, occurred when I got, when I found this book uh, called UFOlogy by James McCampbell in Kepler's bookstore in Menlo Park, California. And I flipped it open to this page and it was about a Air Force sighting. Uh, this, by the way, this was mid 1970s. And um, this was a UFO that was intercepted by a, a B-57 or I should say the other way around. And the B-57 was on an electronic countermeasures uh, training assignment over the Gulf of Mexico. This sighting became Condon report, Condon committee report, sighting number two. But then they, they pulled it out just before publication. Fortunately, Jim McCampbell kept copies of everything, and he was able to transcribe what they put in here. And I will very quickly read this paragraph. Um, the UFO, which was as big as a barn and flying rings around the B-57, was intercepted at approximately Meridian, Mississippi, a signal with the following characteristics. It was a, emitting a gigantic micro, microwave signal. Um, frequency 2995, um, I guess it was uh, megahertz. It says MC here, I'm not sure what that is. I'm, I'm guessing it was about 2.9 gigahertz to three gigahertz. Um, yeah, MC must mean million cycles. So <laughs> that tells you it was gigahertz. And the pulse width was 2.0 microseconds. The pulse repetition frequency was 600 uh, cycles per second, sweep rate of four RPMs. And it goes on like that with a grocery list of characteristics of the signal emitted by this UFO. With that one clue, he was finally able to piece together the mystery that had begun when he first started to study gravity, which was how to control gravity. And he published a paper. I will show you the paper. And I think Mark has held this paper up before. In 1981, he published a paper called Anti-Gravity with Present Technology. Bad lighting, but that's it. And it is a very, very... Uh, scholarly work, which is so typical of my dad, but there are, the initial pages are, are really cool because he explains what he's after, which is uh, cheap and easy space travel. And he shows a picture of a vehicle that would use this propulsion system. And by the way, I was eight years old when he first uh, told me that cheap and easy space travel was the goal uh, that he was seeking. Let me see here, one page. Yeah. Anyway, the craft that he had in mind looked like this. And he was trying, uh, I think he was trying not to make it look like a UFO. But um, in a way, it reminds me of the, um, of the uh, flux liner. Uh, it's, it's, notice that it has um, uh, axial symmetry, just like all UFOs have. Doesn't have wings, doesn't need wings. And... Um, it runs on, to say it runs on microwaves is a bit of a, uh, uh, a bit of a false description because the combination of microwaves and electromagnetic energy is what depletes or uh, gets rid of the force of gravity in the vicinity of the vehicle. And then you can use whatever kind of a propulsion system you want. Now, I just want to make some contrast between my dad's technology and, and what, what I, uh, I've seen in other um, efforts to overcome the force of gravity. And that is that because he started from a theoretical perspective, uh, based on, you know, his decades of experience, he, um, he got his PhD from UC Berkeley, worked on the cyclotron and so forth. Because it started there, uh, the technology that resulted is very scalable and it's flexible and it doesn't require near, nearly as much energy. And the reason for that is that he knew exactly what he was aiming for. And that was the dynamic nuclear orientation process. And so I, I'm willing to go into the theory part of it to explain that. I think it's... Uh, 
it gets us down to subatomic mechanics, but it's not difficult. You can visualize it. You can visualize everything in the theory. So um, maybe I should take a couple of minutes to uh, describe that. Yeah, if you could, I, I would I would very much appreciate that. I see Mark, and I, I can't see, the way Zoom is set up, I can't see a lot of these. And so I should apologize if I'm missing anything in the background. But um, yeah, this is exciting. I know that Mark Sokol and and the, the engineering team and Jeremy Reese, they've studied your work intently, but I, I'm very much a novice. And then uh -huh. anyone who watches this online would probably also benefit from it. So. Yeah, that, that's great. I would love to go over this material. And um, it's a very basic lesson in physics followed by a lesson in technology. And um, well, because of my dad's work at the cyclotron, he viewed physical reality a lot differently from uh, lay persons or graduates of high school physics and so forth. And um, he spent many an hour explaining it to me. And for some reason, it never really clicked into place until after he was gone. And I started doing these books. And then suddenly I realized how simple it was. Um, the history of physics can be uh, put into a nutshell by saying uh, the refinement of filters, the refinement of measurement. Initially, we looked at the world with our eyes and that was one form of reality. But when telescopes arrived, we could look out into space and that extended reality to the cosmos. And then when we got microscopes, we could look down to microscopic levels of reality. And what did we see there? We saw uh, molecules and atoms and um, elementary particles such as electrons, neutrons, protons, and that kind of thing. He pushed it one more level to a, le a level that is hypothetical, but which he had to deal with every day. That is the level of virtual processes. So uh, virtual processes, I'll describe it in another language and then I'll break that down. The creation and annihilation of charged particles on a subatomic plane. It's a blizzard of activity that surrounds all uh, planets and your body and my body. Uh, every object that has mass uh, partakes of virtual processes. They're electrically neutral and they extend, um, well, let's look at it this way. This is a diagram of a particle. Uh, the particle's energy concentrates in the center, a hard knot of electromagnetic energy, and it dissipates as you go farther from that center. Right here, it fades off to infinity. The, you, the usual measurement of a, the diameter of a particle is something called the Compton wavelength, which is right here. That's Planck's constant times mass times the speed of light. Okay, but the actual extent of the, vert of the uh, particle goes beyond the measurement given by the Compton's wavelength. Now I'm gonna tell you how gravity works, but the reason I went into that digression, it seemed on, on the whole scope of reality from the cosmos down to the elementary particles is because they're all interconnected. Microcosm conditions macrocosm. That was one of his favorite sayings. There's a causal connection between this virtual process level and what you're seeing in the galaxies and planets. So here's what happens. This is typical of him. He would do things in a mathematically organized way. He would say, well, if I can show an attractive effect between two particles, then it would be true of all particles, all elementary particles. And the reason he focused on elementary particles is simply that gravitation is everywhere, regardless of the temperature or the composition of the mass. The only thing gravity relates to is mass itself. And what is mass made of? Elementary particles. It's all elementary particles. So we have to believe that gravitation arises from some feature of elementary particles. That was the beginning of his chain of logic. Now, I realize at this point he was departing from general relativity, but general relativity itself was a departure from um, the more empirical approach of, say, uh, Maxwell and uh, the predecessors of general relativity. My dad studied general relativity with one of the greatest uh, experts in the world, Victor Lenzen. Einstein himself called Victor Lenzen um, uh, no, uh, the man who knows my relativity theory better than any other human being. 
So that's who my dad studied with. He knew general relativity very well, and he knew special relativity very well. So um, he didn't like general relativity, so he created his unified field theory out of special relativity. Now, not to digress too much, we have two particles, and uh, you can see that their extended energy field overlaps in this darkened area here. This changes, so as far as this um, particle is concerned, is picked up mass from the particle on the other side of it. And likewise, this particle has picked up mass from this particle uh, by the over, in the overlapping area. So we have a new equation to describe the di diameter. And I'll move it in close, hoping that you can see it. Uh, the area that's shaded is uh, m plus delta m, the change. The mass of this particle is now m plus delta m. This gives a new equation for the diameter, which is here. And, um, and you can see just at a glance that this uh, causes a contraction or an energy flow, making the diameter smaller. That is the force of gravitation. So you could say, um, and by the way, it was able to extract or, or obtain all of the laws of gravity from this model, including the gravitational constant and um, the inverse square law and a lot of other things. And all of the behavior of gravity was explained at last. So um, this attractive force exists between these two elementary particles. And by you know, extension, it extends throughout the planet, throughout our bodies, throughout uh, the moons of our solar system, the entire solar system, the sun itself, and the galaxies on the macrocosmic level. Everything obeys this inclination to come closer together because of this simple force, which is minuscule between two elementary particles. But when you multiply it by a gazillion particles, it becomes very strong. OK, so he had a model of gravity. And in 1960, the Air Force wanted to talk to him about it because they were worried. There was a, um, a Soviet scientist who was claiming that they had anti-gravity vehicles and they were maneuvering in space like jet planes maneuver over in the atmosphere. And the Air Force got kind of concerned about that. So they had the survey written by a researcher named Dr. Maurice Garbell. So coincidentally, Garbell lived in San Francisco and my dad lived in, or the family lived in Palo Alto. And we uh, got together at a restaurant. I remember uh, Dr. Garbell, my dad, and they were talking about his theory and Garbell said off the record, your theory is the only one I encountered worldwide since Newton that has a, any chance of an engineering application. Well, that was very encouraging news. And uh, he wound up, you know, talking to an Air Force colonel at the Foreign Technology Division at uh, Ames Research. And this man uh, wanted to start a project uh, based on researching my father's gravitation theory. However, he said something really weird. He said, uh, we're going to classify it higher than the Manhattan Project. And um, you may not be able to obtain a security clearance that high. So you won't be able to work on your own project. And at that, my dad said, you mean you're going to take my theory. You're going to take whatever comes out of it. You're not even going to allow me to work on it. And the colonel said, well, that is a distinct possibility. My dad had a top secret clearance at the time, so uh, he knew all about the Manhattan Project that was actually going on while uh, uh, he was romancing my mother. But um, and my mom worked on the Manhattan Project, so anyway, uh, uh, he wouldn't have any part of it. He didn't like secrecy. He came home shaken. I remember him coming home absolutely shaken by that interview because things were going the opposite direction from where he wanted them to go. He wanted this technology to be um, used by all, the common lot of mankind, because that's where it would do the most good, not delivering weapons uh, across international boundaries, like a missile. So um, he decided to work on it on his own. Then um, fast forwarding to the book, Ufology, um, oops, 
I got this, and he got his um, uh, he got his insight. So now we're up to the technology, and uh, coincidentally, because of probably because of its origin, uh, it explains a lot of the mysterious features of UFOs, such as uh, how they ex how they accelerate from a hovering position to Mach 10 instantaneously without killing the occupants, or why they spin slowly on takeoff. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson had a field day making fun of that, but it's uh, easy to explain. It's a side effect of um, the propulsion system. And also because, as I said, uh, he had a general description of it derived from his theory, he could see many other applications. For example, you can um, transmit the effect through an aluminum wire, say to the floor of a factory and get the um, uh, armatures on, on robots to run, say, a thousand times faster because they will not crash into their mechanical boundaries and overbank and destroy themselves. They can, they'll be able to go at any speed. <laughs> That's one. You could bring ships out of dry dock. You can, uh, you can make artificial gravity too because the flip side of this technology is you can increase gravity. So how does the technology work? Well, since the gravity takes place where these two particle fields overlap, whatever you can do to interfere with that should interfere with the force of gravity. And here at long last was a link between electromagnetism and the gravitational field, which nobody's been able to find. So, um, Dynamic nuclear orientation. Uh, the UFO sighting suggested they were doing something with microwaves. So he went down to the technical library and he found a book, which is available online, called Dynamic Nuclear Orientation. And it produced the state of matter he was looking for, exactly the state of matter he was looking for. He knew that had to be the solution. So what is dynamic nuclear orientation? It um, is a process for obtaining orientation of the nuclei of uh, atoms. And it's, it's a proven effect. It's already in use in the assaying of organic molecules. But here we're using it in a different way. We're getting the nuclei of aluminum uh, atoms to orient themselves. And then the Earth's gravitational field has to do work to create disorder in the ordered virtual processes of the nuclei. And in doing so, the Earth's gravitational field loses a tiny amount of energy. But you're cycling this over and over, remember 600 cycles per second. And what you're doing in effect is pumping gravitational energy out of the vicinity of the vehicle, and it kind of hovers in a cloud around the vehicle. Um, and you are liberated to go any speed you want, and because inertia and gravity are linked, it's the same group of random electromagnetic processes causing inertia as causing gravitation. And that's why Einstein's equivalency principle, the, uh, the inertia and gravity are one to one. You can't distinguish an acceleration by um, inertia, say sitting in a plane, from the force of gravity. Uh, so this is an explanation of why that works. Anyway, he decided to build a device. Well, he didn't do that first. He, he tried to get backing. And this went on for a long time. And finally, he gave up and decided to, get, to do it himself. And he did some experiments at a university without their knowledge um, with some friends. I, I have some charts here from the experiment. I won't go into detail on them except to say uh, that uh, they showed exactly what he predicted. And uh, okay, here, here's a good one. Um, this is this is a good example. This one uh, says the correlation is very clear. As you can see, there's this seesaw, this big um, sawtooth pattern. Now, here's the weight of the object at the beginning. Then you turn on the field and cut it off and when you cut it off, the weight begins to descend because what's happening is the gravitational field is 
is doing work on the oriented nuclei of the sample. So it's going to be depleted and the sample will lose weight. Then you turn on your field again, the weight spikes up because now you're driving the same forces that cause gravity and they're going to affect the um, sample more. But you, you shut it off quickly and then the weight descends even more. Now, you don't see more saw teeth here because he had a problem with overheating the material. But what you do see is exactly the sawtooth pattern that he predicted. And um, anyway, that seemed for him, that was confirmation of his theory. I did, you know, he said he could not publish it because it would be ripped apart by a good scientist who would see that, you know, he didn't measure one thing or, and another to verify it, except the existence of that pattern really convinced him. And then I, when I wrote the book, what I was hoping would happen is that electrical engineers such as Mark would um, take over where my dad left off and run the experiment again, but better. And it looks like that's what's beginning to happen. And uh, if so, you're going to see a, um, a new industrial revolution because space will become the new frontier for industry. You're going to be able to move factories into space. Everything that Jeff Bezos dreams about doing, you're going to be able to do quite easily. And I, the example I like to use is the quarter pounder hamburger. Presently, um, when Jeff Bezos launches a rocket with a quarter pound hamburger on it up to the International Space Station, that trip from Earth to the space station costs about $3,000 just for a hamburger. But if he had had gravity control, he could do it for a few pennies. And not only that, the cap would the cap would be lifted on the amount of the payload. So the space frontier opens up, space industry starts, and ground transportation is completely remade. You can build um, private uh, you could build private space vehicles, but it would be much easier to build private air cars. Uh, that would be able, capable of traveling at Mach 2. So um, these are the possibilities opened up by the technology. And one uh, footnote here I want to add is that uh, at first I was worried about publishing this book because I thought Big Oil might be really mad about this. Um, but then it occurred to me suddenly that Big Oil needs gravity control technology more than any other industry, because like the whale oil industry of the last century, they're running out of oil and their peak oil is coming and they're polluting the planet like crazy. And they're engaged in a game of deception with uh, all of us about the sources of global warming. And this would relieve them of all those problems in a, in a uh, second. And then they could go into something much more lucrative like mining asteroids. Because, well, just one asteroid flew by the Earth, I believe it was in 2016, maybe. It was made completely of platinum, and it was worth over a trillion dollars. Since then, I've heard about several other asteroids worth many trillions of dollars each. And these would be open to these oil companies that are presently involved in the much more difficult field of fossil fuel. They wouldn't have to give up one to go to the other. They could just phase one in while they phased out the other. So painless and more profitable. And I'm very confident of that. And if anybody happens to know the Koch brothers, I'd be glad to talk to them about it. Yeah, well, well David, let me go to, yeah. uh, th thank you for, I mean, that's a wonderful introduction. And I know that this is very much in depth because uh, like for instance, Mark has been telling me about your father's work for like close to a month now. And, and every time he explains it to me, there's more and more depth to the subject. So. I think that the bright side to it is I think that the people with the engineering interest and ability and the know-how are starting to work on this, you know, and I, I think it's exciting as well.